Well, hello, everybody. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you are for one of our panelists. It's the middle of the night in New Zealand. So we welcome to all of you all around the world for joining us here again for Sibjo's Jewelry Industry Voices. Welcome back to our community. We're so, so grateful that you're able and are choosing to spend some time with us here today. Please feel free to identify where you are joining us from, connecting our professional group, our friends and colleagues from all around the world. One point as well, we've noticed that the default setting in the chat room is for everybody to post to panelists only. So that means that many of your messages that I see coming in here are just visible to the panelists. So just check your settings in Zoom and make sure that you're posting messages in the chat to panelists and attendees. And then all the attendees can identify and see where everybody's calling in from today. So as I said, welcome back. Welcome to Jewelry Industry Voices. This webinar series hosted by Sibjo looks at the issues of interest in the jewelry business from the perspective of industry figures. We expect this webinar to last about one hour. Those of you who are with us regularly know that this is becoming a bit of a running joke in that we get into a good discussion and sometimes, most times, we do go a little bit over an hour. We respect your time. And if you do need to leave, please feel free to do so. Um, the, the webinar is recorded and it will be posted on Sibjo's website and YouTube page um, by tomorrow afternoon. So thank you to, to all of you for joining, but also today, thank you very much to our sponsor for today. We are very pleased to tell you that uh, Uni Diamonds has joined us as a sponsor for season two. So we extend our thanks and gratitude to Mahia Bohanju, the CEO, and also a previous Jewelry Industry Voices panelist. We thank you, Mahia, and all of your team for your support and your collaboration with our webinar series. The weather here today in London is a little bit chilly. So please identify where you're calling in from and possibly what the weather's like with you. We had a wonderful Easter with quite nice sunshine and then suddenly it started to temperature started to drop and it's actually been snowing for the past few days so we hope that the weather is better where you are today as i said i'm in london my name is uh, edward johnson uni diamonds our sponsor today provides the first holistic ecosystem for the diamond industry with a vision to create a transparent credible and efficient marketplace. Consider Uni Diamonds as an Amazon for professional diamond buyers, working as a one-stop shop for all of your diamond needs. For more information, please visit uni.diamonds. That's on the interweb, by the way. You remember the days when we used to say www in front of things? We don't need to now. Anyway, as I said, I'm Edward Johnson in London and my fellow moderator, Steve Benson. I hope the weather is better where you are, Steve. Uh, yes, it is. It's, uh, it's sunny over here and about 22 degrees in Tel Aviv. Uh, um, so we're not complaining, certainly better than snowing. Um, uh, just a few technical details about how we're going to operate today. I think a lot of people already know what I'm about to say. Um, the, uh, the webinar itself will run, uh, should, uh, will run about an hour. We, we, we always promise to end on the hour and then don't. We tend to run a little bit over, but we'll try to keep within uh, reasonable boundaries. Um, you are invited to, uh, to, to ask questions, although that we request that you use the Q&A box that is um, made available by, um, by Zoom, and then we will get to those, uh, we'll get to those questions at the end. Um, uh, the, uh, the webinar itself, we, we, we are recording it and we'll upload it to Sibjo's YouTube channel, uh, uh, maybe even before the end of today, certainly by tomorrow. Uh, so uh, you will be able to uh, 
go over the webinar again if you if you are interested and certainly we'd be happy for you to recommend that anybody else watches it um and that that's pretty much it over here so what i'd like to do is to um to uh invite uh, gaetana cavalieri the uh, the uh, subject uh, president to say a few words uh, gaetana please thank you very much Stephen and ed and uh, i would like to take this opportunity to thank all our panelists and uh, you can see that today uh, uh, part of the the four of us we are surrounded by beautiful ladies from all over the world uh, literally you know new zealand africa continent europe and uh, and uh, 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 the the gentleman uh, 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 justin uh, uh, he looks very thai uh, uh, but uh, but uh, even though he lives in thailand um, but I can see from the uh, attendees uh, that we are uh, uh, honored to have uh, uh, the entire world with us from uh, New Zealand, uh, from Shehana to uh, 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 Mexico to California. So oh, oh, I think that uh, the attendance is truly international, as honestly we are. I would like to take this opportunity to express my deep appreciation uh, uh, for all of you uh, uh, panelists and, and for all of you attendees, uh, because that means that what we are doing, uh, thanks to uh, Edward and Stephen, uh, it looks to be interesting because if we have uh, uh, 100 people uh, in this moment, 134 people uh, in, uh, in our uh, um, uh, webinar. That means that we have something interesting to say. And for sure, the panelists will have some even more interesting to say. So I don't want to take more time. Again, thank you very much. I hope you all are in good health, safe. Uh, uh, unfortunately, this pandemic is still uh, uh, very bad in, uh, in, in Italy where I am. I am still in the red zone, but I hope that everything will go back to normal, even though it will be a different normal. I don't want to say a new normal, but a different normal. But still, I'm sure that we will have uh, uh, the opportunity and the pleasure to meet each other in person and to shake hands and uh, as we use in Italy to kiss each other. So thank you very much. Enjoy the webinar and I hope to see you very soon. Gaetano, thank you so much for that warm welcome. Um, let's introduce our panelists today. Firstly, Joe Matoli and Komatsu Ramudipa from Kwame Diamonds in South Africa. Now Kwame was founded in 2008 starting out as a diamond brokering business. And from 2016, the sisters established a diamond cutting and polishing business in Johannesburg. Joe acts as the CEO for the company, having started her career as one of the first black women stockbrokers in South Africa. Komatsu joined her to run the operation and the financial management of the company with a wealth of business experience as an optometrist, having no prior background in the diamond business, together they are determined to find innovative and exciting ways to bring out the brilliance and fire in diamonds. Joe and Matsu, a very warm welcome to both of you to Jewelry Industry Voices. Thank you so Thank you. much, Ed, for, for, for having us. We're going to have a challenge with two sisters wanting to decide who gets to speak first all the time, right? Okay, no, I'll be the younger sister and let the older sister um, go first. Okay, that's very noble. Thank you. So tell me, what does Kwame Diamonds mean? I mean, the name Kwame is what it is. Go for okay. it. Motsu, why don't you go? Because Joe spoke first. Well, she gave away the secret, but I'm the older one, so <laughs> that cat is out of the bag. So um, Kwame Diamonds, Kwame is um, Joe's son who was born on a Saturday. So um, in, in, in Shona, 
Um, Kwame means, uh, um, is it Shona? It's, it's, it's actually in the Asante tribe. It, yes. it, 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 yeah, it represents being thankful. So from Asante meaning thankful. Um, so Kwame was born and because I had battled so much and for so long to have a, a, a child or rather my second born, and I was quite grateful. So hence the, the, the name Kwame and that, that we gave him. And I think it resonated very well with our company because mm -hmm. uh, between my sister and I and our family, we are quite grateful for, for where we are right now and the family that they have been to us and the support and everything that they've given us, you know? So it's, it's pretty much being thankful. Thank you, very nice. Family values are so important in this industry. So that's a nice story of the name of your business. Thank you for joining. Next, I turn to our friend Elodie Daguzan from the World Diamond Council in Paris. Elodie joined WDC just over a year ago. Uh, a French native, as we can see from the Eiffel Tower outside your uh, kitchen window there behind you. Um, Elodie is already <laughs> a 20-year veteran of the diamond industry, having filled a variety of roles in the diamond value chain. Most recently, she was head of communications and industry relations at Rubel and Menashe, which is a diamond-based, uh, Paris-based diamond trading company. Elodie, it's so nice to have you with us today. Thank you so much. How is the weather in Paris today? I can see it's it's bright outside, but that might be a virtual background. Is that the real life behind you? I had, um, no, actually no, but the, the weather is quite okay. It's quite sunny outside. Thank Good. you. Thank you for um, having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you for joining. Next to Shahana Kimiangatal. Sh uh, Shahana is the owner of Shahana Jewels in Auckland. Shahana Jewels is a pearl jewelry online brand selling all over the world, based in Auckland, New Zealand. All the jewelry is made entirely by women in India and New Zealand, which is in line with the brand's vision to create a financially inclusive world where the women have the power and the opportunity to improve their lives. Currently, Shahana Jewels partners with Kiva a nonprofit that provides business loans to women, some of whom are from the Pacific Islands, where the idea, where the idea for Shahana Jewels was born 10 years ago. Shahana, it's very early in the morning for you over there in New Zealand. So thank you so much for being with us. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Ed and Sip Joe and Uni Diamonds for having me on the panel today. Thank you for joining. It's a pleasure to have you with us, bringing, bringing such color to the existence with your beautiful flower. Thank you. Um, and last but not least, I turn to Justin K. Prem from Bangkok, from the Institute of Gem Trading. Justin is an American lapidary and a gemologist living and working in Bangkok. He studied gem cutting traditions all over the world, as well as attending gemology programs at both GIA, Gemological Institute of America, and AIGS, the Asian Institute of Gemological Sciences. He is currently working on a book about the worldwide history of gemstone faceting. He works as a lapidary instructor for the Institute of Gem Trading, as well as writing articles, producing videos, and giving talks about gem cutting history. He is also a fellow webinarista, webinar host by that I mean, having started a webinar series himself and also along with our friend Vincent Padja over one year ago, as you were reminded in your Facebook memories just recently, Justin. Nice to see you and good evening to you in Bangkok. Thanks, Ed. Thanks for having me. I like the term webinarista. I've not heard that before, so maybe I will add that to my list of of titles. Thanks. I'm happy to be here. It looks like we're going to have some fun tonight. I, th I think I might have trademarked Webinar Easter already, but there oh, we go. Okay. okay. <laughs> but you definitely qualify as one as well. So, um, 
Let's get started. But before we go, please note that none of the opinions or information offered in this webinar constitutes any legal, financial or official advice. Subjo provides a global perspective on the German jewellery industry. So please, for more precise information, we encourage you to play an active part in your local trade associations and seek advice relevant to your location and also for your business. What we want to discuss today is we want to go through the personal career and business journeys for our panelists. But we also want to see and discuss how they've all been able to break down barriers. We want to see and discuss how they've been able and how they've benefited from challenging the norms that sometimes perpetuate in what is a very traditional and conservative industry, the German jewelry industry. And we want to also talk about building diversity, diversity for race, diversity for gender, and diversity for age, and how that benefits the industry going forward. So to get started, can I take us down to South Africa, down to Johannesburg, and start with Kamatsu, down there from Kwame Diamonds. Now, in many respects, Matsu, your company's history is linked to that of South African democracy. But Kwame Diamonds' mission has also been to empower women through diamond beneficiation. Can you tell us more, a bit more about your journey since you started in 2008? Um, Ed, actually our journey started, um, let me say in 2000. So as you can imagine with the dawn of democracy, I mean, all of the South Africans that were privileged, uh, previously disadvantaged had dreams of being millionaires now that the opportunities were open. So the logical thing for everyone, I guess, was let's go for mining. So we were not an exception. We ran towards um, mining and we quickly learned that it's not as easy as that. And we had to pause and find out what actually do we want out of this democracy? What is our why? Why do we want to go into this, um, into this mining or into this mineral uh, industry? So we, so we saw it fit to go the easier way at the time we thought. So we went for a beneficiation license. And no, sorry, we went for a dealer's license initially. So a dealer's license, it meant we must know how to evaluate, how to sort. And we initially started trading as brokers. So when people came from overseas to South Africa to, 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 to tend us, we used our license to allow them to purchase uh, diamonds. But that was a bit of a strategy on our side because it allowed us to have a front seat um, witnessing of what the trade was about. And that's when the penny dropped that we want to be in the manufacturing space. We don't just want to be traders. We, don't want, we just don't want to be dealers. We want to be in the thick of things. So that's when the manufacturing um, uh, uh, idea came in, but that went with a beneficiation license. So that's where our, our, our journey honestly started. Yeah, that was such an important time and such an important move for, mm. for the new government to really bring in the black empowerment um, principles into South African business. And, you know, the diamond business really has benefited, but we also need, Joe, if I can turn to you to to yes. really look and think about that positive change. Diamonds do good. And we know all about the campaign from the Diamond Empowerment Fund and, and that important work. But uh, how do you believe that if you look back on the journey that you've taken with your sister, how do you yes. believe that you've brought about positive change for the industry? Okay, so I'm going to be a storyteller today, Ed. I'm going to take through, uh, I'm going to tell you a little lullaby. So um, once upon a time, there was two little girls born and bred in Soweto, right? And um, in the dusty streets of Soweto. And during that time, there was very, 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 and I mean very little um, of hope for a black child in the township, you know? And um, at that time, the country was really at the verge of civil war because then, you know, it, it, was, it was just chaos. So it was the uprisings and all that. 
And uh, despite the, the tough upbringing, the two girls believed that they were destined for, for greatness, really. And um, we pushed the boundaries. They knocked on doors until their little voices were heard. And believe me, they were very loud voices, all right? Um, today, Kwame Diamonds is a 100% Black-owned business uh, owned by two women. Um, it's a home to 12 youngsters that were born and bred in Soweto. Um, they are today skilled cutters and polishers and um, are now supplying one of the most sought after brand. And uh, we're supplying them and, and it's, it's, it's such a beautiful thing to, to, to see. And you tell me, Ed, if it, that is not positive impact or proof that diamonds are doing good, I, then I don't know because we are the good, we are the impact. And I'm quite pleased with, I go to the factory, what I see um, that we've afforded these youngsters, removed them from the streets and put them and gave them skill to put food on their tables. Um, I think that is the best. It's not even the good. I think that is the best. And I'm saying to the diamond industry, look no further. We are the living proof. Yeah, that's that's really nice to hear. I mean, you say, you know, 12 youngsters all having grown up in Soweto. We wish you growth so that you have 120 um, youngsters you. benefiting from, from, from the townships uh, around Joburg as well. So that's a nice story. Thank you so much. And Let's, let's turn to Paris and turn to Elodie, because your journey into the jewellery and gemstone industries has, has been quite long and varied, um, but it's now led you to this very important and, and really very political role that you have now as executive director with the World Diamond Council. Initially, though, why did you get involved in the industry? And more importantly, how did the choices you made along the way bring you where you are today? Well, thank you very much, Ed. Thank you for your question. And thank you, Sibjo and, and, uh, and Uni, for this event. Well, you know, I will follow on the footsteps of, of Joe. You know, it started, you know, with the story. I was a 15-year-old girl with a big dream. You know, I wanted to be in the diamond business. You know, it was, it was a dream. It was a calling. There's no other way to explain it. And and actually my parents were very supportive to the point that they are actually right now, you know, watching that webinar with my brother. Uh, <laughs> so I had this dream and I wanted to pursue it. Uh, my father explained to me that it might not be that easy, you know, because I was also a woman and, you know, we we're in the mid nineties and, and I had no family in the business. But I said, you know, I think I might have replied, you know, I don't care, I won't go for it. You know, and that's and that's what I did. And you mentioned Rebelle Menashe, which, which um, was actually my first employer. I started as a diamond sorter because uh, if you want to become a diamond buyer, you need to know about diamonds. So I wanted to learn how to sort the diamonds. But, you know, life is unpredictable. So at some point I quit and I went from companies to companies chasing my dreams and never reaching, you know, that thing that I wanted, you know, being that buyer. But life is great, you know, I found my way back home to Rebelle Menaché, to a man who is uh, now the president, Stefan Volzok, who became my mentor. And that man, full of conviction and wisdom, gave me an opportunity, you know, to travel the world, to be their ambassador, and to learn, as usual, another job within the diamond industry. And through this opportunity, you know, I, I learn about his vision of service, how you are of service to your clients, you know, um, but beyond just selling the goods, how you can bring them information, how you can bring them stories about the industry, talk about transparency. And, and you know, um, after a few years, you know, it hit me and it was obvious. Rebelle Menaché had to become a member of the WDC. And three years later, here I am, you know. And, you know, if I look back 20 years ago, my dream was to become a diamond buyer. But the thing is, I was born to serve my industry in a very different way. So. You touched on something very nice there, that, uh, you know, the importance of, of mentors in the yeah. industry and, you know, how that has helped you. And I'm sure 
in the future, um, you know, you will pass on that and become a mentor to somebody else. And, you know, I would encourage everybody, if you're young, find a mentor. If you've got experience, find somebody to be a mentor to. Uh, it's it's invaluable way for us to pass on knowledge to the next generation coming through. And you're never too old or too young to, to be a mentor or a mentee. Thank you, Elodie. It's, it's, it's nice to hear that story. Um, let's wing our way across, all across the world, across the beautiful oceans to, to New Zealand. And Shahana, your, your journey for me sitting here in London is very exotic from, from Fiji to New Zealand and all the South Pacific Islands. And your business now, your brand is very much focused on that part of the world, or at least telling the stories of that part of the world. And you're selling online with a women only team. And you know, your marketing voice and your story is, is, is consistently authentic in many senses. Tell us more about how you got started and why you chose the pearl business. Thank you, Ed. Um, hello, Bulavinaka and Kiora, everyone. My name is Shahana Kimyanga Tao. My journey really started when I lost my mom to cancer. You know, during the grieving process, I just realized that life was too short. Um, I wish she did more things for herself and put herself uh, first more. And uh, basically just, you know, told myself I wasn't going to live my life that way. And at the time, I had a day job that I hated quit my day job and started a beauty business at 23, failed miserably, <laughs> decided to go back to school and study business. So I did that um, and really kind of, you know, um, knew what I wanted for a business. And one day while I was on holiday in the Cook Islands with my husband, that's where he's from. If you don't know where the Cook Islands is, it's in the South Pacific. It's another Pearl country like Tahiti. Um, I met a pearl farmer. He was um, staying at one of the accommodations we, were, we rent. And I started talking to him. And the more I spoke to him, the more I could see the potential of the pearl industry. But also he had female pearl technicians that was really inspiring for me as you know, to see that a woman was um, a pearl technician because it's quite labor intensive being on the pearl farm. And um, you know, the more I spoke to him, he just kept ticking all my boxes and being Chinese, Indian, Italian heritage, you know, jewelry is like a huge part of our culture. Uh, it was, you know, there was no way I would not be having a, pearl, starting a pearl business. That's a nice story. Thank you. And, and you know, it's, it's, uh, it's telling that out of a tragedy, so much positive energy has come out in the story for Shahana Jewel. So thank you for sharing that. Justin, you too crossed oceans in building your career, moving from the States to what many people believe is the color gemstone capital of the world, Bangkok. Tell us about that journey, but also why you chose to devote yourself to the craft of gem cutting and also now teaching future generations about how it's done. Thanks, Ed. Well, um, I think maybe compared to everyone else here, I, I had a little bit of a late start. Uh, if I go back to myself at 30 years old, I didn't even really know that there was a gem trade. I never interacted with it, never saw it. When I was 30, I moved to California and somebody sort of took me to a gem show and instantly I was like, whoa, how are they cutting these tiny things? You know, I, I think some people get in love with gold and diamonds and, and pearls even, but for me, it was colored stones. And I saw those and the artist side of me was just very, very curious. And so I immediately tried to find out like, how can I learn how to do this? You know, and, and it, it, it's a little bit hard to figure out because there's not really a clear path, at least where I was. But luckily in America, there is these sort of uh, lapidary clubs where you can you can join and learn. And as soon as I started to play around with that and get my hands dirty with the gems, I pretty much instantly became addicted. You know, I, I was going there every day to the club and learning how to cut and then eventually learning how to facet. And as soon as I started faceting, I, I knew I, this is like I'm going to change my whole life now and I'm going to I'm going to I'm just going to let myself become fixated upon this thing. And so I knew then, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know anything about gems at that time, just a little bit of how to cut them. So I knew 
I have to go to school, you know, I need to understand gemology so that I can be a better cutter. So I, I wanted to, that was the, that was a hurdle right there because I just didn't have the money for it. You know, I knew as an American, I, I knew like GIA was really one of my only options if I, if I was going to stay in America and try to get a job. But I thought, okay, I'm not going to stay in America for school though, because GIA uh, in California, you know, it's not really in the middle of the gem trade, but I knew that Bangkok was, and I, and I, you know, after a little bit of research found out that there was a campus in Bangkok. And so I just decided, okay, I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to get all my savings for, you know, six months and uh, just see if I can pull off this crazy plan. And I moved to Bangkok and I did school and uh, kind of like Elodie was saying, you know, you have this moment where you're not sure what to do and then the mentor comes into your life. And for me, that that mentor was Vincent Pardew. Um, well, he was the first of a few because, I mean, Bangkok is a great place to find mentors because there are so many people here in the trade. But, you know, Vincent kind of took me under his wing and, and I was, even though I was already in my 30s, I was still very new to the culture of, of Asia and the culture of the gem trade. So he really kind of taught me what was going on out here, how to behave, how to interact with people. Um, and then from the gemology side, you know, he really helped me kind of get a little bit more worldly experience, more than just what I learned in the school. So I had brought my fasting machine with me. And so I had just, just set it up in my apartment when I was here. And I just, that's how it began. And then eventually I met one of uh, Vincent's coworkers, Victoria, who eventually became my wife. And so Victoria is also, a, she's a French gem cutter. So she kind of became my second mentor and she helped me fill in all of the professional cutting gaps that I was missing from my, my training in California. And, and from there, it just, it became very, very serious. And, and shortly after that, I got the invitation to help open this gem cutting school. And that was already now, I think three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, ever since then, it's just like, the the obsession and the fixation has turned into a career and then that has helped me connect with you know younger people or or other maybe even older people but different people that want to learn about cutting and since i've kind of made it my mission to become an expert upon cutting and travel all over the world and learn about cutting uh, it just seemed like i was maybe a good person to help you know pass that knowledge on and teach so that's that's what we've been doing out here is just cutting and teaching and, you know, building. And learning how to make videos for YouTube. You know, I think yeah. I would like to encourage all of the attendees today to check out all of our panelists and their social media profile. But Justin especially has got a fantastic YouTube um, channel with, with videos that, that really you've started to learn how to do that really since the lockdown. Am I right in saying that, yeah. Justin? Yeah, yeah um once co once COVID hit the school closed i lost my job for all intents and purposes and so you know it you know we we already had the idea of doing some kind of video thing and i just i just fully embraced it and so yeah now it's like a year later and yeah as you said my youtube channel is getting pretty full uh, full of videos so and full well, of webinars absolutely so let's get into having a discussion now about breaking down barriers we've heard about all of your stories and how you've moved you know across oceans and from 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 challenging upbringings and difficult situations in life but so you've all had to break down barriers LED if I look at your journey do, do you think that since you had no family background in the industry do you believe that it was a challenge or an opportunity when you started to enter the diamond trade well, Ed, when I started, I was so sure it was a challenge, you know, so actually it made me work harder to, to learn more. But as it turns out, you know, that was actually an opportunity because it pushed me. And I think just to um, to go back to Justin's point, you know, the, the the passion that you have inside, plus the mentor, you know, that is just right here to lift you up and give you confidence that would help. That's what would help me, you know? And, you know, bear in mind that I was raised in, in France, which is not a country known for diamond trading. And, and I was uh, pursuing a dream of becoming a diamond buyer. Therefore, you know, it had to be for a big brand. You know, I, I never assumed it would be for a diamond trader. And the thing is, 
uh, I'm not going to lie to you, I would have given anything, Ed, to be born in a diamond family because my wildest dream would have been to go and buy rock diamonds. Uh, but that was not my life, you know? Um, so, so I guess you just, you just push through. And, and um, I've been very lucky, uh, I have to say, you know, uh, even though gender inequality is a fact in every country, I've been spared from it Ed, uh, in France. But I've been discriminated uh, due to my lack of diploma. You know, I was so focused on diamonds that I studied gemology and I didn't have an MBA or, or I'm not an engineer, you know, so, so I felt like I had something to prove. And, you know, uh, at the same time, you know, I was also learning Hebrew. You know, I thought it would, you know, help me. 20 years ago, when I started working with Rebele Menashe, I, I started, you know, uh, um, at night, I was working, you know, uh, learning by correspondence um, because I, th I thought it would help. Yeah. But, yeah. You know, I think what matters most uh, for me, um, it's not about breaking barriers. It was about meeting the right people. Yeah. And I was lucky enough, you know, I was, I was so focused on trying to learn from the best that, that I was able to meet extraordinary people. And to, yeah. just for example, the two presidents uh, that I've had the pleasure to work with at the WDC, Stefan Fischler and Edward Asher and, and, and my team, you know, so today, um, I think what I'm most grateful for in my old journey is the people that are surrounding me and teaching me every day. That's nice of you to say. I can see that Stefan, both Stefan and Edward are joining us here today. So they'll be pleased to hear that though. I'm sure that you tell them that on a regular basis as well. Um, thinking about you know, the lack of family connections when you enter the industry, Justin, you know, really gem cutting is, is a skill that's traditionally passed down from, well, in, in reality, from father to son, not even so much down to, to daughter. So, you know, you are now teaching people and, and cutting out that relationship and teaching them how to do it and bringing new blood into um, that industry. Has it been, I mean, you know, is it still hard to become a gem cutter in the 21st century? Yeah, I think maybe, if we think about it from the from the professional point of view, this might really be one of the hardest times in history, because, you know, as I've traveled around Europe and looked at, you know, the different cutting centers and cutting cultures of Europe, you know, all, many of the countries of Western Europe have a long tradition of gem cutting. But when you look at them today, you, you don't you don't stumble into those places anymore. You know, when I go into London or Paris or Idar Oberstein, you know, places that are quite famous historically for gem cutting, uh, apprenticeships and and you just don't find very many young people cutting he even here in Bangkok another place that has become very well known as a gem cutting hub it's it's not easy to become a gem cutter and there aren't very many people that that are teaching and they're also I think there are less and less people that want to become gem cutters so I you know, in, in my view, the culture is in danger. And so I've kind of taken it upon myself since I'm in this position of, of being able to teach through the school to try to help that, you know, partially through, of course, doing the classes and trying to connect with people that want to become gem cutters. But, but even more importantly, maybe, is kind of convincing people that gem cutting is worthy of the, their time, you know, like yeah. convincing people who may, like, like myself, 10 years ago who didn't know anything about gem cutting. So I'm sure there's someone out there that would be an amazing gem cutter that doesn't even know that that can be a job. And I, I've met people all over the world that are gem cutters, but, but on a very hobby level that would love to become a professional gem cutter, but they don't know how to make the transition or they, they don't have a mentor to help them get into the trade or, or whatever it be. So. I'm constantly just trying to almost be like a cheerleader for gem cutting and, and, you know, whether it be through making videos or giving talks or, you know, like all of my presence, I, f I think is sort of aimed at, you know, showing the, showing the artistic, beautiful, you know, uh, meditative side of gem cutting because it's such an interesting art that has such a cool history and, you know, it's not really something that anyone talks about you know usually if people want to do something hands-on it's going to be becoming a jeweler you know becoming a goldsmith yeah. but actually it's quite interesting 
and it's a sort of a different path very important in the industry though for you know without the gem cutter the whole the whole gem trade stops absolutely you know, yeah and you, it, it's it, it's bringing in a real sk skill as well you know so yeah a real focus as you said meditative you know getting yeah. into the zone and producing a really quality product and that takes training and skill and years so yeah thanks for bringing that in that's that's an important perspective um, i like the meditative bit that's important <laughs> um you know if if we also think about the challenge when you're entering this industry you know trust is crucial and shahan if i can bring you in when you're establishing a new business you need to establish that trust with suppliers even when you've possibly got no track record how did you work on on building trust with your suppliers when you started by doing lots of research <laughs> so um, I did a lot of research um, and looked and saw, you know, lots of uh, factories and pearl farmers out there. But for me, even though I was at entry level, it was really important to work with people that I liked and that liked me and that we shared the same values because I just believe that business is so much easier when you work with people like that. And um, so I did a lot of research. I contacted people. We had meetings online. Um, I told them my five-year plan. And I think, I don't know if it was luck, but a lot of them were really kind and nice. I think they could relate to us being at infancy stage. Um, and, you know, they were very accepting and happy to meet us, you know, with MOQs and things like that, meet us halfway. Um, we also traveled to see them in, you know, factories in India. We traveled to the islands to pull to the pearl farms. We stayed on the farms, worked on the farms. So um, we really built those strong connections that way uh, by, by making the effort to go and see them. Yeah, th and I, I, you know, the travel and the building of the relationships and all the work that you've done um, to, to establish those. I think, you know, people really need to understand that if they're getting started. It, it's a lot of work, you know, it's, it's a lot of background. And I like what you said as well as, you know, choosing people that you like, you know, it's important that, that the business and the relationship is sustainable throughout um, and that your, your feelings for each other, not just as business people, but as people, you know, they can, they can grow and develop like, like the business that you do together. Exactly. Another challenge when people are getting started, especially in the diamond business, so I'd, I'd like to turn to, to Joe and Komatsu, is, is capital. You know, one of the biggest barriers for entering the diamond business is, is that need for capital. And sometimes financing options are limited, especially if you don't have family or established backgrounds. So Joe, with your stockbroker background, you obviously knew about money and value, but how did you overcome, overcome the problem of, of diamond financing? I'm going to have to use the quote of 2020, which is, you're on mute. Okay. I'm unmuted. Did I unmute myself now? You, you did it perfectly. Thank you so much. Uh, that's the problem of uh, being born uh, before computers, you know, you better <laughs> with technology. Um, so, Ed, you, you know, um, one of the beautiful things that um, about growing up in the township is that you, you become a survivor, you know, and uh, very quickly you learn to have um, plans in place to make things happen, you know, with or without the money. You know, we, you've got the ideas and you know that the ideas are solid. And now here we are, we are in this diamond business. Uh, we've decided to take the leap of faith and get in. And then uh, we asked our father, so where is the unit trust that you said all the time you are buying for us? And it turned out those unit trusts <laughs> did not <laughs> amount to much. They did not even pay for a first year um, varsity, varsity um, education, you know. So then we had to quickly tend to plan B and say, okay, here we are. New South Africa opportunities are opening up. What's on the table for us? We are the right gender. We are female. Uh, we are the right demographics. We are black. So there's transformation buzzword going around. So Clearly, we're in the right space. Okay, Flair also played a bit. You know, you needed to look the part to fit in. <laughs> so um, what we decided to do is that um, to approach, um, as Lodi said, you know, you needed mentoring. So we decided we're not going to be an island. We, we knew in this industry, we don't know 
much about the industry, but we're going to approach um, um, industry players that are solid, align with them. And then because we had the opportunity, we had the access to RAF from your state diamond trader. We had, we had access to RAF from the mining houses that were saying, if you are beneficiating, we will give you um, the RAF to beneficiate, but it wasn't coming for free. The banks, we had lots, um, a lot of trust was lost between the industry and the banks. So we were not getting any financing or, or options to, to, to fund the business, you know. So we started approaching the industry players and say, look, we're not coming empty handed. We know our worth. This is what we bring into the table. We've got this access to rough. Can we partner? And then um, we will do the cutting and the polishing. You bring the finance and then we get them. You've got the markets, introduce us to the markets, give us the, the access to, to international markets. And that's pretty much at where, where we really, really had to, to think at the, at the, on our feet that it, it doesn't help for you to have the opportunities if you cannot put the money and the good ideas together. Yeah. You know? So that, that, that actually worked very well for us. And, and what you're saying there is really important to highlight, you know, partnerships. Partnerships is what it's all about, you know, and if I can plug the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, SDG 17, 17 partnerships is really an important step for us all building back better and together out of this uh, pandemic. And come on to the, the, the diamond trade is also notoriously male dominated. Tell me. Tell me as a white male, how can I <laughs> allow women do, to do it better? How can women run the diamond business better than men? You know, I think, or I personally believe that the diamond industry exists because of women. Jewelry, 90% of the jewelry that are made are made for women. And it's a sad situation if we are in the hindsight of things. We are thought of at the end when we are supposed to be purchased an item, but we are not thought of to be part of the whole value chain of, 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 of the industry. So I personally think that women are just as capable as men. We know what we want. We set the trends. Um, if I can take you to a, through a story, uh, Ala Jo. <laughs> um, so our first experience of women can do it better is we went to Hong Kong, our um, um, the Hong Kong um, Expo, and we were the only women owned group in the whole um, Diamond Hall. And these men would come to our booth and they would say, um, we would like to purchase, can we perhaps speak to the owner and, you know, um, buy? And we were like, um, owner here. <laughs> and they, 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 they would be taken aback. And it's said that they would be taken aback because they don't expect a woman to be owning a manufacturing company. Yeah. And we, we had to teach them and, you know, defend our stance and by, by, by showing that we know what we are doing, but not necessarily being um, arrogant, but showing them that we've earned our space and we know what we're talking about. So women can do it better if they learn how to trade, if they learn about the industry and if they can be able to take their space and not be shy about it. Yeah, not be shy. I mean, I, I think that's a really important message, isn't it? That, that you know, women should feel empowered to exactly. enter the business. They may have experiences like you had in Hong Kong, but it doesn't matter. You know, you are educating people that you are the boss. Yes, exactly. Um, I, I want to turn to a, a discussion quickly about challenging norms, um, because you know, we know that if people join the business from a family, there may be a, a pressure on them to just do what was done before. And many people in the jewelry business have felt that selling jewelry online is not the right way to go for high value luxury items. Now, that may have changed, of course, with the pandemic. In fact, many people would say it certainly has changed and is changing much more quicker than people imagine. But Shahana, your business has 
always been a digital first business. You had nobody in the family saying, no, that's not the way we do things in the pearl industry. Um, what kind of challenges have you had online since you started? And, and what, what do you do to keep customers coming back online? When I started the business 10 years ago, the online culture in New Zealand was non-existent, <laughs> but I knew that it was coming. And, um, you know, the payment systems that, were, that we have now online, like Afterpay and Layby, they didn't exist. We only had a credit card and uh, PayPal options. So selling a high item ticket um, online was a challenge in that, you know, in that sense. Also, a lot of the customers wanted to touch, feel, and try on jewelry, you know, um, because that's, it's so personal. They wanted to see what it looks like on them. So I had to become really visual. So for example, if someone sent me a message, I would record videos on what the jewelry looked like, what it looked like on, you know, explain to them how to measure their ring size over, the, over a video, tell them a bit about the brand, show them my face so they could trust me to earn that, um, you know, so they trusted me and they'd want to buy from me later on. So I had to do a lot of that. I had to really educate my customers on how to purchase online because it was very new to New Zealand um, 10 years ago. Now it's a little bit different due to COVID. They've been forced to buy online. So that's been a really positive change for our business. With In terms of getting customers coming back, I've had to really connect with my customers and avatar and know who she is. So all our collections we that I design um, speak directly to this woman. Uh, we also make limited collections. So the women know that if something comes up online and if it's sold, I'm not going to make it again because a lot of the women that purchase from me love to stand out in the crowd and, you know, um, be the only one with a piece of jewelry on and, uh, yeah, and feel just feel confident. So those are some of the things that I've had to do to really get them coming back. And, and I want to skip a little bit forward because I see the time. We've got 10 minutes to the hour, but I, I want to skip a bit forward to, to thinking about building diversity within the industry. You know, we've got a wonderful diverse panel here today. Um, but Elodie, you know, from your perspective as an industry leader and, and looking out across not just the diamond business, but, you know, the business as a whole, um, do you feel that jewelry consumers out there do they have the correct perception of the diamond business? And, and how do we go about changing the consumer perception of what diversity is within the diamond business? That's a very good question, Ed. Um, I don't know if I have the entire answer to it, but um, I don't think they actually do have uh, the, the correct perception because uh, our industry is transforming faster than we may think, you know, it's, it's actively engaged on the journey of continuous improvement on every topic. And I guess we're just learning how to communicate uh, more efficiently on, on, on these evolutions of, of the industry. Uh, the Natural Diamond Council is doing a wonderful job, you know, by bringing directly to the consumer uh, stories about the diamond industry and concrete facts about uh, you know, the positive impacts that diamonds will bring uh, to lives and livelihoods. Um, I'm going to give you a concrete example of, of what the industry can do. Uh, the WDC became a member of the RGC uh, recently and vice versa, actually. And I'm actively um, engaged in a working group on uh, uh, gender equality, diversity and inclusion. And for example, you know, in a couple of weeks, the RGC is going to hold a series of events, and I'll be co-chairing um, a roundtable, the European one, with Lita Asher, uh, where we're going to go on a fact-finding mission, you know, on on, you know, inclusion, diversity, um, and and equality, and 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 you know, learn from the experience of individuals. And when I say individuals, I mean women and men, because you cannot do anything if you don't work together. Um, and, and we're gonna learn from them, whether they come from a big company or an SMEs. Um, so that's the kind of action that, that the, you know, the industry is, is taking today. And um, it's gonna come, I think, more 
um, it's going to become more obvious to to the to the jury consumers, hopefully uh, sooner. But um, rest assured that you know our entire uh, industry is working tirelessly towards this goal. And you know, just look at you know CIPJO, WDC, RJC. Um, so, well, I'm personally full of hope, but I'm an optimist. Great, thank you. I, I, I wanted to ask a question to Komatsu, but I can't see her on my screen. Joe, is she still with us? Komatsu? Yes, yeah, she is. I think uh, her thing went out of, the, the, the battery went a bit low, but she's charging now, I'm sure she'll be back. No problem, let me let me, let me jump to you if I can then, Joe, because yes, yes, you know, when, yes. when we're thinking about diversity, South Africa itself has instituted a, you know, a pretty intensive program there within the business community to empower previously disadvantaged group. We talked about the black empowerment, but you know, also raising people up um, in, in the modern economy. Do you believe it's been successful for the diamond and jewelry industry in South Africa? Um, look, Ed, to be, did I unmute myself? Okay, I'm okay. unmuted. Yes, so look, on the backdrop and uh, of, of SA's history, I mean, um, you cannot not acknowledge the damage that the apartheid system has had. You know, the impact was, was quite bad. As a result, it um, left out a huge potential, especially from the, the, the people of color, you know, um, in industries that are now um, at least trying to transform, but it's still becoming very, very, it's, it's still very tricky. So for government, especially in the diamond industry, because it's, it's always been, um, a white male dominated industry, even as um, people of color coming into the industry, it's still challenging because there's trust lost there, you know, um, they still feel like, are you actually active in the industry or are you fronting or are you, are you actually um, playing a meaningful role, meaningful role in, in the industry or you just one of those, you know, you are just in front and then you're not learning anything, you're just getting paid and then you're going. So I think um, the measures that the, 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 the government has put or rather the initiatives that they have put um, in place to try and empower black businesses, especially in the industry. Um, look, they're, they're going to, to, to an extent we are trying um, but there's still a long way to go, my dear. There's still really, really a long way to go. Uh, but legislation has become more and more um, supportive of black business and uh, priority has been shifted to more uh, for, for, for women, black uh, and, and youth owned businesses. So um, the government is trying, but I think the industry itself has got a responsibility um, mm -hmm. to come to the party and assist. So um, the, 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 we can do, we can only do so much, but if Ed, doesn't come through to me and say, or rather as I reach out to say, what is it that you do? And you try also and say, okay, this is what I do. And we exchange ideas. Um, governments can only do so much. At the end of the day, it's entirely up to the industry to try and incorporate, you know, the previously not so exposed to, to the industry. So that's, that's pretty much where we're coming from. I, I agree that there is still, you know, progress has been made, but there's still, yeah a lot of progress and a lot of road, a, a lot of yeah. journey that we need to take down that road. And, you know, I, I mean, I think from my perspective, having been around a while, I've seen such change. And this panel, you know, reflects that change. Um, and that, that change is so positive. And we're getting some really nice comments in the chat here that, that reflects the positive energy that you're all bringing to this webinar, but also to the industry generally. One of the ways that we really help to, um, demystify uh, and, and bring more diversity into the, into the jewelry business is through education. And Justin, you're very much part of that role, um, bringing education in a very specialized area into the jewelry business. How important do you consider your role in, in, in allowing different people from different backgrounds to enter the jewelry business through teaching them? Yeah, I think it's it's incredibly important. I mean, you know, kind of to go back to what Joe said, you know, the proof is right here, you know, like if if I just use myself and as as an example of somebody who who didn't know anything at all, who didn't have a background at all. And because of the education that I got from the gem cutters that I met, and then the education I got from the gemology programs that I met, and then the education I got in real life from the mentors and the trade itself, 
you know, you, you, you can't do anything without that starting p position, you know, whether it's a school or just a, a mentor or, or just even a YouTube instructional thing, you know, without education, we can't get very far. And whether we're talking about gemology or gem cutting or, or diamond trading or whatever, you know, we, we need to get some experience before we can actually start to interact in a, in a, you know, a realistic way. And if we want to make change or we want to, you know, for ourselves or for others, you know, for me now, my goal is to help young people or other people become gem cutters. But of course, you know, there's a lot of other good reasons to be involved in education. And, and you know, if you want to come into this trade as a as an as a unconnected person, then I think education is going to be the only the only real door that there is, you know, somehow. And continuing education as well. You're never yeah. you're never too old or knowledgeable to learn something. And if you can always go back and take another course, uh, I think we'd all highly recommend that at any time. Um, yeah. I do see that we've turned the hour and we're still having a great chat. We've still got a lot of people on the line with us. Um, but if people uh, do have places to go, um, please feel free to 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 um, to log off if you need. I'd prefer if our panelists didn't log off at this stage because I do still have a few <laughs> questions. Um, and uh, I'd like to turn to sort of some final thoughts, really. You know, one thing that's always guided me is advice that I've received throughout my career. And I'd like to ask you briefly, each individual, if you can, to share what one piece of advice you would give to others wanting to follow in your footsteps. Joe, I see that your um, uh, Komatsu is back with you. So, should I start with you, Matsu? What one piece of advice would you give to people? Um, I would say, find your why. Find your why. Don't be afraid to dream because each and every dream is valid, and don't let anyone talk you down. Thank you. Very nice. And Joe. Okay, I, um, from my side, I would like to say to the people that are really interested in coming into the industry is that um, you need to have a sound and solid blueprint. Remain committed to your cause, network, be informed and be part of the, of, of the disruption. Don't be caught in your comfort zone. Thank you. LED, can I turn to you for final thoughts? Yes, of course. Well. Mine is very simple, you know, find your purpose. You know, I found my life purpose, which is learning. And my work purpose is, you know, telling people about the diamond industry and educating them about it. So I believe that, you know, life without purpose is that you will put your, the energy of your passion and your commitment in a less efficient way. So just go, you know, uh, look inside and, find what you know animates you that that would be my my advice thank you shahana um to you with advice for people following on what i've learned in the last 10 years is that 50 percent of people never really reach their full potential because of other people's insecurities and fears so if you're really passionate about something make sure you get the right advice from the right people the people that are doing it or have done it not the ones that are afraid of your big vision um, and to just really believe in yourself and back yourself up because you just never know what will happen in 10 years time. Thank you. I'm leaving the last word on this to the only man on the panel and I know I'll get in trouble for the last word <laughs> going to a man, but Justin, your thoughts on this? Um, for me, I think the best advice I can say is, is don't be afraid to take a risk. You know, if you, if you don't move out of your comfort zone and out of your bubble, I think everybody here has basically expressed that same idea in one way or the other, you know, if you don't, if you, if you can't step out of your normal lifestyle in order to bring some extra stuff in, whether that means a class or in my case, moving across the world, you know, then you're not, you're not going to be able to get to where you want to go. So just, just be fearless, you know, be smart, of course, but you have to take risks and you have to move out of your, your comfort bubble if you want to make your dreams come true. Thank you. We do have some questions from the audience. And um, if, if we have a little bit of time just to, to go through a few of those. Um, 
we've got we've got a nice one here from our friend um, Agath Bukasa from um, De Beers. Hi, Agath. It's nice to have you with us. Thank you for joining. Um, she asks, can you provide a bit of practical steps? How one or, or practical steps one can take to approach a mentor? How do you actually find a mentor? Um, Elodie, I, I know that you kind of fell into a great relationship with, with your boss at, at, uh, at Rubel and Menashe, but what advice can you give Agath there for a, how well, to approach a mentor? Actually, Ed, I have two mentors now okay. and they come to you. I, I think, uh, uh, I, I don't know if there's any concrete, you know, uh, way to find them, but life put them on, on your path and then you just need to be ready to listen. The first one for me was a man. The second one is a woman. She's even younger than I am, but extremely brilliant. And you just need to be ready to receive and learn. And then just like Justin said, give back, teach yeah. in return. Justin, you had something. I, I wanted to off, I, I hear what Elodie is saying, but I also wanted to offer another thought to our audience. Sometimes you can also just approach the mentor themselves. I know many people that I know here in Bangkok that are, you know, high up people in the trade that work in labs or that work in schools or whatever. They're usually very uh, open to getting a stranger's email or getting approached at a, you know, a conference or something. And almost everyone I've ever met in this trade has been some of the nicest people that I've ever met. So I think it's also a good idea if you have an idea of a mentor that you've seen or someone whose book you've read or whatever, figure out how to give, get an email and maybe you can go have coffee with them if you're in the same place sometime and you know, you never know what's going to happen. It's worth, it's worth trying for sure. Thank you. Yeah. And I, you know, if I can just add also, you know, join your local trade association and network and be part of um, the industry structures and the meetings and the conferences. That's where you meet people, people meet you. And, you know, I think in the chat, it had been mentioned that WJA, the Women's Jewelry Association in the US has a very active mentorship program. And I'd encourage other associations and other leaders to start similar programs as well, because it's so important for nurturing the next generation into the business. Um, we, we have a question here from Stefan Fischler, Elodie, um, it's nice to see Stefan joining the conversation with a question, but this is about the future of physical retail. So Shahana, I'd like to bring you in with this question if I can. What is the future of physical retail as technology is opening huge online opportunities? I believe that um, the future of um, technology is really taking over actually, especially online buying because technology has advanced so much and there's people, people's lives are so much busier now and people are more comfortable buying online with 100%, um, you know, returns, 30 day returns. I feel that people are more comfortable when it comes to purchasing online. And I think it's growing, especially now with COVID um there's been a really high peak with um online purchases so anybody you know justin you're doing so much online um and i, I know you know you have a, a very active business cutting and selling with, with with your wife victoria as well where do you see the future of physical retail a uh, good question you know for us since we started our cutting business here in bangkok our business has almost been 100% online. I mean, we, you know, we're so far away from the end customer, we don't usually ever get to meet them. Like even, even rarely do we even ever hear their voice. So it's everything is either emails or texts or, or photos or whatever. So um, from, from my point of view, which is really like uh, inside of the trade, not necessarily to the end retail customer, but you know, I, I can't imagine not doing business online, but but since COVID started, we've definitely noticed so many more people are looking at our Instagram, our Etsy, our website and buying stuff and ordering stuff and sending us rough to cut, you know, I mean, that's aside from all the school stuff, but, you know, I, I think it's definitely the the new frontier and it's definitely something that we ha we've we as an industry have been a little bit hesitant to to tap, you know, many other industries are have full, obviously fully embraced 
the web as a way to buy things. I mean, we just have to look at Amazon for books and we see that, you know, uh, the book industry will never be the same, but you know, that really hasn't happened yet for the gem trade, but I think COVID definitely gave it a good kick in that direction, uh, whether we liked it or not. And it's, I think it's been quite interesting and, you know, like I'm not, since I'm not so old in this industry, I'm not so invested in the old way. Uh, it's kind of exciting, you know, like it, I'm curious to see where it goes and I'm curious to see how the, how the retail customer, um, becomes more and more comfortable and how we become more and more comfortable with communicating that with them that way. That's right. Yeah. Thank you for that. Listen, it's, it's 11 minutes past. We have overshot the hour as we often do. I could talk to all of you for hours and hours. It's been so entertaining and we've had some really nice positive comments um, in the chat as well. Um, Gaetano, can, can we uh, turn to you to, uh, to say a few kind words at the end? Thank you very much, uh, Ed, and, and thank you very much to all of you. Uh, I, I had my mentors today. <laughs> you know, even though I, I start when I was uh, literally a baby, I was born in the diamond and jewelry industry. My son is the generation number eight. And this year we are celebrating only 200 years, at least the first 200. <laughs> Uh, but uh, uh, I can see uh, that uh, truly and sincerely, I have had a wonderful lessons from each one of you because I am really delighted to add all of you as uh, my mentors. I have a long list of mentors. Uh, but one thing that we all share is the passion that you have, is the commitment that you have, is the fact that we are all a dreamer because the diamond and jewelry industry is a dream world. You know, you may remember, especially you, Justin, uh, you know, in America, there was in the NBA, the dream team. Yeah. You may remember the dream team. Uh, or at least you are very young. But yes, in this industry, we all together. Number one, we are a family. Number two, we are a dream team. Number three, we work for our wonderful women entirely uh, uh, and tirelessly all the day long. So the fact that I can see here these wonderful ladies with us but it's nothing to do with gender equality or diversity. It's truly a pleasure to have uh, this kind of uh, uh, wonderful ladies. And uh, Justin, I'm sorry for you, as, as I am for me, as, as Edward. But still, this is, these ladies and all the ladies in the world, though, those ladies are the reason of what we do education, dream, uh, 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 and, uh, and make everything a reality. Diamonds, stones, pearls, color stones are truly gems, but the jewelers and the manufacturers are the tailor who dress the gem appropriately. Thank you very much. Thank you for those words to finish. Um, it's been a real pleasure to, to, to chat with you guys today. Justin in Bangkok, thank you so much. Our best regards to you and to Victoria. And, you know, I look forward to checking out your future webinars as well. You're running a great series at the moment, promoting the importance of reading and reading yeah. books on gemology and educating. So please continue doing that as the great webinarista that you are. Thank you. Shahana, thank you. You can go to sleep now. Thank you so much for being with us and, and bringing the lovely color of the Pacific Islands to us in our webinar today. It's really much appreciated. And we wish you all the best to all of the women in your business and all the women that you support through, through Kivu and all the initiatives you have down there. Thank you, Ed. Elodie, my dear, we will look forward to you leading us on gender equality and your partnership with RJC and Eris and all of our friends in that important organization. 
Thank you for joining us. Um, look after Paris for us. We look forward to the day we can visit your beautiful city. And thank you for joining today. Yes. And last but not least, Joe and Matsu. You know, you've been such an inspiration today and you continue to be an inspiration to the people of South Africa. And we wish you all the very best. We wish you the best to your son, Joe, named after a famous, possibly the most famous African leader into independence in Ghana, Kwame Nkrumah. And uh, please continue doing what you do. And thank you to you for joining. We thank to um, Uni Diamonds and all of our sponsors for this series, the Natural Diamond Council, Platinum Guild International, and also GemCloud. GemCloud will be the sponsor for our next webinar on May 6th. So that will be uh, one month, the first Thursday of the month again. We look forward to you joining. You'll receive information on that if you're on Sibjo mailing list. If you're not, why not? If you would like to be, just send us an email to the email on the screen or follow us on social media. That's it from me. That's it from my panelists. Keep up the embracing all manner of people into this wonderful, colorful, varied industry of ours. And please continue to stay safe. If you're able to, please take the vaccine. We will leave the, um, the webinar open for a little bit so that you can read through the chat box if you so wish. But I wish you all, all a safe rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye.